Grace, mercy, and peace be yours in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text is from our gospel lesson. I read again verse 2 and just the first couple of words of verse 3. And Jesus opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are. Here's the reading of our text. May God add this, his blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. The Sermon on the Mount contains some of the best known teachings of Jesus. And the opening verses, the Beatitudes, is one of the best known portions of the Sermon on the Mount. But the problem with these verses is that we can easily hear them as all law, as all conditional statements. So it is easy to think, if I do A, then B will happen. You know that line of thought, if I become poor in spirit, then I will get the kingdom of heaven. If I mourn, then I will be comforted. If I become meek, then I will inherit the earth, and so on. And this approach to the Beatitudes turned them into a heavy burden, one that we really cannot bear. But if we consider the Beatitudes first by focusing on the very Greek word translated blessed, we begin to get a different understanding. The Greek word is makaroi, and of course, that doesn't sound anything like our word blessed, or even like the word beatitude. The word beatitude comes from the Latin translation of the Bible that is called the Vulgate, and that was the main translation used in the Western church for over a thousand years. That Latin word used in the, in the Vulgate that is translated uh, the Greek word blessed is where we get our word beatitude, and it sounds like beatitude. You all probably knew that it was a Latin word anyways, but that's the Latin word for blessed. Translations like you find in some modern uh, Bibles like fortunate or happy or favored, all fall short of what Jesus means here. In Matthew's gospel, the word blessed is practically a synonym for saved or redeemed. So, for example, in Matthew 11, Jesus sends word to John the Baptist, who is in jail, assuring John that Jesus is the Messiah, the one in whom we are to believe. Jesus ends his message with the words, Blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Or in other words, saved is the one who is not offended by Jesus, who instead trusts in him. In Matthew 16, we find the great confession of Peter. You know, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And in response, Jesus says to Peter that he is blessed. In other words, Peter is saved by grace through faith in this great confession, or more precisely, the faith that this great confession reflects. You can look at other passages as well, like Matthew 13, 16, or Matthew 24, 46, but you get the general idea that a person is blessed if they believe in Jesus. That is, they have received the redemption Jesus has earned for them. They are saved and so forth. The next thing we need to see to grasp the, the Beatitudes in their gospel light is the difference between the present and the future. Notice that the first Beatitude in verse 3 and the final Beatitude in verse 11 speak about something that is, present tense. The rest of the Beatitudes speak about things that shall be future tense. All of these future tenses focus on the second coming, the new heavens and the new earth, when we will be raised with perfect bodies and souls, where there will be no more sin, corruption, and all of that other stuff that 
sin brings into our world. Now, when we consider the Beatitudes, we can easily think of them, as I already said, as things that we are to do to achieve the promised reward. However, when we remember that being blessed is to be saved, and we remember that we don't save ourselves, but salvation is something that God does for us through Jesus, therefore, the Beatitudes are not speaking really about something that we should do in order to be saved. They are blessed, that is, they, that is, those who are justified are already poor in spirit, have received mercy, and so forth. It is our state as Christians. These blessings are arranged in two ways. In verses 3 through 6, the condition or the state of the believer is put first, and then the result. In verses 7 through 10, the result is named first, and then the condition or the state of the person, the blessed, the believer. So, for example, in verse 3, the condition of the believer, being poor in spirit, is named first, and the result, theirs is the kingdom of heaven, comes second. In verse 4, the saved are those who mourn, and the result is they will be comforted. The Redeemed are meek, their state, and will inherit the earth, the result. Christians hunger and thirst for righteousness, their state, and they will be satisfied, the result. In verses 7 through 10, that order is reversed. The status of the believer is put last, and the result is put first. So in verse 7, those who have received mercy is given second, whereas the result is given first. They are merciful. Believers who are truly merciful uh, are merciful because they have received mercy. Moving on to verses 8 through 10, we understand that then that we are not to try to become pure in heart in order to see God, that is, to be saved, but know that those who see God are blessed with pure heart. Then those who are sons of God, again, those who are saved by grace through faith in Jesus, become peacemakers. We don't try to become a peacemaker to become a son of God. And those who have their citizenship in heaven are, because of that, persecuted for righteousness' sake. Now, before we consider exactly what any of these descriptive phrases mean, we need to review quickly the biblical teaching about our old nature and our new nature. And we actually spoke about that in some detail in last week's sermon, which has been posted on our blog. So if you don't remember it, you can go back there and get a, a, a fuller treatment of that. In relationship to the Beatitudes, we realize that Jesus is describing our new nature, not our old nature. Remember, the old nature is not converted, it is killed. The new nature, which comes forth from the waters of baptism, is what is being spoken of in the Beatitudes. The next thing we notice about this new nature is how it is made in the image of Jesus. So this description is first a description of Jesus in his, whose image we are being made. Jesus is the ultimate expression of the poor in spirit, of being meek, of hungering and thirsting after righteousness, of the mercy of God, of the one who sees the Father, of being the Son of God, and certainly possessing the kingdom of heaven. He was persecuted and all kinds of evil was spoken of him because he is who he is, the incarnate Son of God and King of the kingdom of God. He showed mercy even when he was hanging on the cross, and you get the idea how that works. 
Paul tells the Corinthians, we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one glory, from one degree of glory to another, being transformed into the image of Jesus. And to the Philippians, Paul wrote, Jesus will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject all things to himself. So the new nature is in this image of Christ, image of Jesus, that the Holy Spirit is forming in us. This new nature of the believers is what Jesus is talking about in the Beatitudes. So now let us look a bit at this description of our new nature, which is also a description of Jesus. With each beatitude we consider, we need to remember that we are speaking about God's good gifts, not our meritorious actions. As is so often the case, we also see that the corrupt world, or our old nature, rejects God's gracious gifts. Jesus begins by saying, blessed or saved are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The word poor is most often used by Jesus like we would normally use it. That is to say, somebody who doesn't have a lot of money. However, in this case, Jesus qualifies the word poor with the phrase in spirit. So Jesus is certainly not talking about someone with no savings. There is only one other time that Jesus uses the word poor in Matthew's gospel in this theological way, and that is in chapter 11, when Jesus is sending a message to the imprisoned John the Baptist. Matthew writes, Now when John, when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to them, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. And the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. When Jesus says the poor have good news preached to them, he does not mean to exclude those who have a generous portion of the world's wealth. All people are poor and have the gospel preached to them. This poverty is an object, objective state. Now, all people may not know they are poor in this use of the word, poor in spirit. In fact, many people don't know it, but that doesn't change their status. All people are poor in this way. We are all poor, miserable sinners. In responding to John, Jesus is picking up the words of the prophet Isaiah, who wrote, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Once again, poor is not referring to people who are strapped for cash. It is referring to those who are poor spiritually, who have no good thing according to their old nature. This is their condition. This is the condition of all humanity. We are all lost sheep, and the shepherd has to go and seek us out. We are all the lost coins that the woman has to sweep her whole house and look in every nook and cranny to find. However, we need to remember that Jesus is speaking to the blessed. The blessed know that they are spiritually poor. The blessed are the sheep that Jesus has found. The blessed, they're the coin that the woman has found. The blessed have heard Jesus say 
repent, for the kingdom is at hand. The blessed are Christians. This is where understanding the old nature, new nature, teaching in the Bible come to our aid. Jesus is not speaking of us according to our old nature. He is not speaking, uh, he is speaking to us according to our new nature. Our corrupt old man rejects the idea that we are born sinners and out of fellowship with God. It rejects the idea that we cannot merit salvation. It rejects the idea that apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. As Paul said in our epistle lesson, the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But the new man, the new creation, hears Christ's call to repent. Therefore, Paul goes on to say in our epistle lesson, but to us who are being saved, the word of the cross is the power of God. The new man knows he is a poor sinner dependent on Christ, and the new man believes in Jesus. For such poor sinners who have received Christ, who have become Christians, they have already the kingdom of heaven. That's the present tense one. What a wonderful thought. A kingdom carries with it the idea of the area where a king rules. The kingdom of heaven is where God rules and is king. And Luther picked this up in his explanation of thy kingdom come in his small catechism when he treats the Lord's Prayer. Our new nature is already a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. That is, it already obeys God. God rules in our new nature, in his life, the new man. We receive the blessings of that reign through baptism, absolution, the Lord's Supper, the Word of God, and so much more. In our worship services, we stand in the very presence of God. Even though we are poor sinners, because we are forgiven sinners and we are citizens of his kingdom returning now to the beatitudes as they reflect who jesus is well he certainly has the kingdom of, of heaven doesn't he his will is now always has been and always will be in complete harmony with the father our new nature reflects this perfect nature of our lord Yet he becomes poor for us and for our salvation. He took upon himself the sin of the world, of all humanity, throughout time. And as since then, he became the greatest sinner of all time, so that we poor sinners might become children of our Heavenly Father. Now, we don't have time to give this sort of treatment to each of the Beatitudes, just uh, looking at the first one there. However, following the pattern that we have used in this sermon, you can ponder the rest of the Beatitudes for yourselves. You will hear about Jesus. You will hear about what he has done for you. You will hear about God's great blessings for you that you receive because you are believers in Jesus. In other words, you will hear a message that encourages you instead of a message that beats you down. You will hear a message of the gospel. You will hear about God's good gifts to all repentant sinners. And that is a blessing indeed. Amen. May the peace of God which passes all human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.